awesome. As Isaiah 53, 6 states, um, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've each turned everyone to his own way. None of us are righteous, not one. And I'm reminded that God cares very much how we treat one another. And I think we all fail in this area. So let's join in the unison prayer of confession. It's in your bulletin on the inside page. Mighty God, by your power is Christ raised from death to rule this world with love. We confess that we have not believed in him, but fall into doubt and fear. Gladness has no home in our hearts and gratitude is slight. Forgive our dread of dying, our hopelessness, and set us free for joy in the victory of Jesus Christ, who was dead but now lives and who will put down every power to hurt or destroy when your promised kingdom comes. Amen. Let's take a moment for silent confession and just everybody have a moment to confess our own personal sins. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. As 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive them and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible even says that he'll remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. He sees us as completely clean. When he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the beautiful white robes of Jesus. He sees Jesus in us. And we're being transformed to be like him day by day, glory to glory. Thanks be to God. Amen. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was Black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men. My example is He. The Word became flesh, and the light shined among us. His glory revealed. Living He loved me, dying He saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. One day they led him a Calvary. Mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree, suffering anguish, despised and rejected, bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. And that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me, living he loved me. Dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. 
Don't you imagine that heaven's going to be like that? Everybody will join in song, and it'll just be wonderful. Would you please join, join us in the Apostles' Creed? It's on the insert in, in your bulletin, too, as well. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 2 Corinthians 8.14 tells us that in our abundance we are to supply for another's need, so that in the same way their abundance may supply for us in our time of need. Will the ushers please come forward?
Thanks be to God. Philippians 4.19 says, God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father God, we bring these offerings before you. And we know, Lord, that these offerings and the music and everything is a sweet, sweet smelling sacrifice to you, God. And we just thank you. And we pray your blessings upon those who gave and those who will receive. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now. Good morning. God is good. All the time. Especially today. <laughs> well, 11 years ago today, God brought me into this world, and I have felt like God has just put me around the most wonderful people at home, at play, and my church. I'm always around somebody who can just lift my spirits when I'm down and lift them even higher when I'm happy. God is wonderful.
that song was written by a girl named Jamie Grace. Probably a lot of you have heard that name before. As a girl, she was tortured by people because she had Tourette syndrome. That's sounds or ticks that you can't control. So she could just be walking one day. She had trouble walking. She had trouble talking. And people made fun of her because they thought she was different. But in God's eyes, we are no different. We are all the same. God loves us all Amen. the same. And so when people would bully on her, she had an older sister. And her sister would go straight to her and say, hey, let's go play a game. Get her mind off of things. She wouldn't even go to the bully and say, hey, stop bullying my sister. Because she thought that in God's way, she wanted to handle it the way that God would handle it. And so God always gets the mind off the bad side. And I would like to mention that it's Aaliyah's birthday today. It's Aaliyah's birthday today. And our neighbor has, shares a birthday with her. So this is on the 11th year. She was born on Easter, but it fell again on the 11th year. So it's an, an extra celebration for us today. Tell me, does it make me crazy? Well, maybe I got something I can't explain. And the beauty of it never changes. It's got me wrapped up, I'm all caught up, I can't help but say. I'm a God girl, that's who I'll be. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I can't deny it, wouldn't even try, I'm your girl. In a crazy world, I'm a God girl, that's who I'll be. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I can't deny it, wouldn't even try, I'm your girl. For the whole wide world to see. Say, hurry up, find looks, time's taken away. Well, I'm not being lazy, I'm still waiting for, still waiting for the right boy, cause I only want to listen to your voice. So I'll be listening, always listening to you every day, cause I'm a God girl, that's who I'll be, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I can't deny it, wouldn't even try, I'm your girl. In a crazy world, I'm a God girl, that's who I'll be. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I can't deny it, wouldn't even try, I'm your girl. For the whole wide world to see your name in lights, the biggest dream, my all in all, your all I need. Hand in hand with the master of all creativity. And I won't stop until I know all my Facebook friends and foes look at me and only see one thing. I'm a God girl, that's who I'll be. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I can't deny it, wouldn't even try, I'm your girl. In a crazy world, I'm a love girl. And I'll always be from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. I can't deny it, wouldn't even try, I'm yours. God boys out there too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And happy birthday. Thank you. Although we're the ones who got the gift. <laughs> All right. 
Now that we have the technology taken care of, you not only have two very proud <laughs> you not only have two very proud parents, but a proud church family. And what's more, when he gets to see this, I'll bet Pastor Gene is going to be proud of you for reminding us that God is good all the time. Well, friends, what a glorious day to celebrate. Uh, this morning, I want to take us through the experience of the resurrection and maybe help put together a little bit of that because going from one gospel to another can get a little confusing. And so we'll see if we can make a little bit of sense of it, and also see what it is about the way that God's given us the story of his son's resurrection is going to show us about how we live today. We're going to start with Matthew 28, uh, beginning at the beginning of that chapter, verse 1. It says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. What is the sequence of events? Well, this is a little tricky because the Hebrew mindset, Jesus and his disciples were Hebrew, and they had this way of thinking that isn't exactly like the way we here in America tend to experience or view our world. Whether you're talking about an upper story, God's way of looking, or a lower story, a human perspective, it was a little different from ours. And to understand their minds, they tended to think about important events and the people or actions that represented those events, and they told their stories that way. What wasn't all that important to them was the exact chronology, what happened before what, or what time it happened. And so when one person tells a story, he tells what really touched his heart. Another person tells the exact same story, he tells what touched his heart. And one may talk about two or three people that were in the story, and another may talk about a different two or three people, even though they're describing the same event, because they're describing their heart experience of the event not trying to record it as if they were a historian. So we do our best, since we're very much into that analytical, I want to know what happened to whom, when, and who was there, and who wasn't, and how the order of things went. That's our mindset as Western world folks in the modern age. We try to put that order onto an accounting that didn't intend to give it to us. So for all of us who need a little bit of that, let me try to do some of that ordering for you. That resurrection morning. The women head out for the tomb as the sun comes up. There was an angel who appeared at the tomb. The angel rolled the stone away. In his appearance and his actions, there was an earthquake as well. Now, there were guards at the tomb, and those guards were so afraid of the angel and the power and the glory and the might that they shook and then fell unconscious onto the ground. The women either just arriving or perhaps witnessing all of this, had to be told by the angel not to be afraid. The angel then invited them to go into the empty tomb and see where Jesus had lain. And they saw his grave clothes, which had been wrapped around him and had been heavily filled with spices so that they weren't just dry cloth, but they would have kind of hardened into this spice and cloth mixture, were folded neatly upon the place where he had been laid. And the bit that had been wrapped around his head folded and laid separately. So the women come out, and the angel tells them to go and to tell the other disciples. So the women report to the disciples, but on the way, they run into Jesus. 
Now, it seems that Mary Magdalene had stayed behind at the tomb. Maybe it was too much for her to take in, and Jesus appears to her as well. The women get to the disciples, and they report what they have seen, and Peter and John run to the tomb to see it for themselves. They also encounter the angel, see the empty grave, and come on back. The soldiers who had regained consciousness find the tomb empty, and they go to report to the religious authorities who bribe them to lie and say that the disciples had taken the body, which is a story they began to spread from that day forward. The um, women who have appeared to the, of the disciples and Peter and John are now talking about what happened. Two of the disciples are apparently out on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus appears with them. He walks with them. Eventually, their eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit. They see that it's Jesus. He shares a meal with them, and then they go running back to the disciples as well. They report having seen Jesus, and then before the day is over, Jesus appears to all ten. This morning, as we were gathering uh, for breakfast at 7.30, someone noted correctly that I'm not much of a morning person, and I mentioned that both my coffee and my tie were meant to be stimulants to help me get going in the morning. (laughs) Jesus didn't seem to have any such problem, even after raising from three days of death, he had a busy day, and he got a lot accomplished before the sun went down. Now, one week later, Jesus appears again to the 11 disciples. Remember, Judas has died. He's no longer with them, so there are only 11 of the disciples. His inner circle left. Sometime later, he appears to seven disciples who are fishing up in Galilee. And you remember this is where uh, Peter jumps out of the boat and goes in to see him. And Peter, remembering how he had betrayed Christ, is then healed and forgiven by Christ. Still later, Jesus appears to more than 500 of the followers who knew him, and many of whom were still alive at the time that the Gospels were written. He also appears to James, Jesus, his own brother. And then after the resurrection, that 50-day period has gone by, we come to his final appearance to his disciples in Jerusalem, and then his ascension into heaven, where bodily he's taken up into the presence of his Father. It was a busy 50 days. It's interesting to see how the gospel writers emphasize, first, that Jesus really died. They give very clear details about the crucifixion, almost too much in some cases, or for some folks, including the fact that the Romans were really good at knowing when someone had finally died. Crucifixion was a long process. They didn't want to have to be there guarding a body any longer than necessary. And so when they saw that Jesus had died, they assured that it was so by piercing his side with a spear. They didn't just prick the skin. It would have gone right on up through his lung into his heart. So had there been any doubt about whether he was dead, that would have ended it. And interestingly, John, as he talks about what happens afterwards, says that Joseph of Arimathea, well, talks about how they lowered the body from the cross, how Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and that the body of Jesus was wrapped, and that the body of Jesus was laid in the tomb. Notice the language earlier in the book is, Jesus did this, Jesus did that. Now it's the body of Jesus. He's making a very clear point that this is not Jesus, this is the body of Jesus we're dealing with after the death. And they're just as clear about the reality of the resurrection, the details, which we don't see in much of any of the rest of the gospel. I mean, think about it. The New Testament might take you a whole day to read if you were to sit down and try to go through the whole thing, but at the same time, it's representing three years of very busy ministry and activity by Jesus and the disciples and all the people around them. It would be very easy, and actually the growth of the church for many years after that, just the gospels themselves are the three years of Jesus' ministry. It would be very easy for the New Testament to be like war and peace or some really thick volume if you were to include this kind of detail that we see about the resurrection all through the story of Jesus' life. But here they took the time to be precise. They describe how an angel rolled the stone away. The question might be asked, who would roll the stone away? You see, the stone had been put in front, and those are not small stones. Now, it's not something huge, man size. It'd probably be about four foot tall because that's how tall the entrance to a tomb in the first century would be. But four foot tall and maybe a foot wide, that's a big piece of stone. That's not something that you just casually roll like you might a bicycle tire down the street. This is something heavy. 
So the women, in fact, it says, didn't know who was going to roll the tomb, the stone aside for them because together they didn't think they could budge it. What's more, the stone had been sealed by the high priests. That meant that they had taken wax and put it between the stone and the tomb and put a mark in it so that if you moved it, that would be broken. That wax seal would be broken. And if that wasn't enough, they also had put guards there. Now, these are temple guards. These are elite guards. This is like having not just maybe a police officer who's off-duty getting some extra pay by guarding the tomb. This is like having a SWAT team guarding the tomb. And there are some stories that were going around because of the bribed guards saying that the disciples had stolen the body, that these 12 men had come up and maybe whacked them so fiercely with their fish that these armed guards, SWAT-type guards, were all overcome, yet none of them were injured. Right. You believe that, you've got more faith than I do. It just doesn't make sense. They record these details because the only explanation of what happened is that, in fact, it happened the way the Bible said it happened. And Jesus arises, and he appears to the women, and then he appears to disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then he appears to the disciples, the ten, Thomas was missing for some reason, but to the ten in the upper room and spend some time with them all on that first Sunday. And a week later, Thomas now with them, he appears to the 11 disciples. The women were probably there as well. So he's appearing to this group repeatedly, spending time with them. And if that's not enough, he later appears to a crowd of over 500 at one time. And the gospel is clear that those 500, many, most of them, were still alive at the time that the gospel was written. We have extra biblical evidence. That means writings that were not part of the Bible and not done by the church. Writings done by the Jewish government regarding the resurrection as a reality. We have extra biblical evidence for this. In fact, friends, it's true to say historically that we are much more certain that Jesus lived, died, and rose three days later then we are certain that there was a person named Homer who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. And if you think that's extreme, we are more certain historically that a man named Jesus lived, died, and rose again three days later from the grave than we are certain that a playwright by the name of William Shakespeare wrote plays 500 years ago. There's more historical evidence for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus than the existence of William Shakespeare. Because God wanted us to have a firm foundation for our faith. A couple of quick lessons that happen in these days after or hours after Jesus' resurrection and the week after. One is a lesson from the road to Emmaus. The two disciples walk with Jesus and talk with him and get a kind of history lesson. He goes back through the prophecies regarding how he would have to die, go into the grave, and three days later would rise again. And eventually... As they're breaking bread, the disciples' eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit, and they recognize that it's Jesus talking to them. Lesson one, only the Holy Spirit can give us the eyes of faith to see the truth the way God does. Only the Holy Spirit can make it possible for us to see God's upper story. Without him, all we can see is a human version, our lower story. The good news Everyone who has Christ has the spirit of Christ. The second lesson, <clears throat> and we learn this from my namesake, Thomas. He wasn't there the first time that Jesus appears on the resurrection day. But a week later, he is with the other ten. And Jesus appears. And Thomas, in the week in between, has said, I can't believe that he's actually alive until I actually see him and touch him. I need to touch put my hand in his side, I need to touch the wounds on his hands and his feet for me to believe. And Jesus appears and Thomas touches him and says, my Lord and my God. And he believes. And Jesus says, Thomas, it's good that you believe what you have seen. It's even better that those will believe who have not seen. See, the second lesson that we learn is that we don't believe because of what we see. We see because we believe. Being able to see the true things of God is a result of faith, 
not the foundation for faith. If you're waiting to see all of the evidences line up and stack up, you may wait until after Jesus has come and you're left behind if that's what you're waiting for to believe. But if you believe, God will immediately begin to open your eyes to all kinds of truths you could never have seen from a hu merely human perspective. I want to share with you Paul's witness to the resurrection and its importance to us. This, I'm reading from the New Living Testament. It's slightly easier to understand some of what Paul says here. And in, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'll be reading some excerpts from chapter 15. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important, and what had been passed on to me. Remember, Paul wasn't there during the crucifixion and resurrection. Paul was around, he knew of it, but as one of the Jewish leaders trying to crush this baby church. And now, sometime before Jesus had been lifted up into heaven, Paul has been saved and has had a chance to meet Jesus, as we'll learn. I passed on to you what was most important would have been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then the twelve. And after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles and last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. So Paul is a first-hand witness to the resurrected Christ. Later he goes on, tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying that there will be no resurrection from the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ was not has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have lived. But some of you may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What I'm saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. And I'm reminded of the King James version of that verse, which is wonderful for any new parent who knows all too well that we will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Let me reveal to you the wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, and those who have died will be raised up to live forever. And we who are living will be transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is not ambiguous about whether or not Jesus rose from the dead or whether or not it matters to you and to me. He has made it absolutely clear that Jesus did rise from the dead. And this kind of testimony from Scripture eliminates all of the options that the world would like to preserve of taking bits and pieces of the gospel testimony that fit their philosophies and then throwing away the miraculous stuff that doesn't. Something said this directly, this absolutely, this clearly, and this certainly must be accepted as truth or rejected as a lie. It's not possible that someone would die to defend such words just as a whim, just because they were confused or in error. And Paul did die to defend 
the gospel he preached, as did most of the apostles. This is truth. You have to believe all of the Bible or none of it. You have to believe that Jesus was Lord or he was a lunatic or he was a liar because he said of himself that he was God. And friends, it is so clear that he is who he says he was, that he is who the gospel portrays him to be, one who gained victory over sin and death and now offers it to you and to me. Paul concludes this passage saying this to us, so, dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. What a great promise. What a glorious gospel. Remain strong and immovable. Believe what you have heard and know to be true, not because you see such ample evidence for it, but believe it because it's true, and then you will see ample evidence for it. I've heard people say, can you show me evidence that will remove all doubt? And my answer is yes, believe and you'll have it, and more than enough. But wait for it to be clear and certain. Try to believe in your own strength, and it will never come. Now, God can use inquiring hearts, and he does often. And he can do things like he did with one of the folks I love to read, Josh McDowell, who set out to disprove the reality of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. He was a law student, and he thought he could provide the equivalent of a legal argument that would guarantee that no one could believe that Jesus had ever lived, let alone died and risen again. And he went and he gathered evidence and he amassed the evidence, and he examined the evidence, and he got saved because he came to realize that the evidence was indisputable. And he put it together in a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and then a sequel to that, and he's done a whole lot more since then. So yes, God can use that inquiry to lead someone into the truth, but ordinarily, God wants us to believe, and then we will see. And I'd like to ask for a show of hands, and this isn't going to embarrass anyone, but if you're like me, then you would have to say that you have seen so many incidents and so many examples of God's reality, love, and faithfulness that it would be virtually impossible not to believe. Even though there's tiny things that have happened throughout your life that could not perhaps persuade any other person, they're evidence that you cannot disregard. Is there anyone else who has had that experience besides me? What a glorious thing. Thank you, friends. And if you haven't yet had that experience, I encourage you to ask God to give it to you. To ask him to open your heart, for it's the Holy Spirit that makes us able to believe. To look to any one of the people who raise their hands to help you in those first steps. And to then walk with him and see his amazing hand at work. I want to conclude by sharing how Jesus summarized what he was all about, the gospel story. This, from the end of Matthew's account of what transpired after the resurrection and before Jesus was taken up into heaven, in Jesus' own words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that leaves us with a great word of encouragement, but also with a question. Because that's the end of Matthew's gospel. The end of Jesus' experience on earth is that he was taken up into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. So how can Jesus, who after speaking these words, perhaps immediately after speaking them, was caught up into heaven, how can Jesus be with us always, even to the end of the age? And friends, that's the next chapter in God's story. And we'll be looking at that next Sunday. 
Lord God, I ask that you would help us like the disciples, to experience so much of your truth that there's no room for doubt and the enemy has no way to wiggle in and cause us to fear or be uncertain. And I ask, God, that our certainty would not just depend on what we see, but on you in whom we believe, a God who cannot fail, a God who is mighty, a God who is loving, a God who is closer than a friend, loves us as a brother, And yet, Father, who is Lord of lords and King of kings. And we will not only embrace you as the one close to our soul, but God, we will also honor you as ruler of all. We crown you, therefore, with many crowns, Lord and God, our Father. Amen. Friends, would you all rise and either turn in your hymnals to number 45 or on the screen, join in giving God the glory. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And now may God, the Lord God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, may he be glorified in and through us by our every word and deed, now and until we're with him again. Amen. Enjoy the resurrection.